When you uh, in Maryland, they play the high school football state championship games at Annapolis, on the campus of the U.S. Naval Academy, and their a wonderful stadium there. And on the wall of the, the, going around the field, they have every battle that the Navy and the Marines have fought in in the history of the country. And it's uh, quite a humbling experience to be there to, and to see that and to see those uh, those locations up close. And we were fortunate enough to go there the last two years with our high school football team. So I have a pretty fresh memory of that. And I bring in uh, one of my top five Marines of all time, Mr. Bill Kearns, this morning. How are you, sir? I am doing great. It makes me wish I would have wore my Marine Corps shirt this morning instead of my health department shirt. Now, you're still the same size as when you got out of boot camp, right? Well, it's in there. <laughs> it's in there. It's it's deeply hidden, but it's in there. <laughs> do you do you go back to Paris Island for fun visits uh, every now and you then? You know, I I did not have a desire to revisit the sand fleas of Paris Island. Yeah. Uh, after you know, after those uh, three months of um of building and conditioning, I I was glad to leave those sand fleas behind. Well, no one no one speaks lovingly of those sand fleas. I oh, understand. No. Yeah, some of them call them gnats. Do you remember the the movie The DI starring with, with Jack, Jack Webb, Webb, where they had the burial detail for the sand flea? Yes, that was the... that, that same sand is there that was in that movie, <laughs> and that same flea, <laughs> and that same flea. Yeah, the, yeah. the eggs have uh, spread as the uh, as we stood at attention at, right after Chow Hall, and our drill instructors would say, "Don't touch that sand flea. You've ate." Now it's time for my fleas to eat. So. <laughs> no thanks. Uh, Bill, let's talk about the legislative session and public health and uh, what you've observed so far this year as they have just had crossover day yesterday, so you have a better idea of what bills will be considered now. We, we do, and it, it, it's been not a real active, and I, I know that's been said so many times on the show this year, it's not been a real active legislative session, but uh, potentially some damaging um, bills have been have been passed and um, we were talking during the break about the the raw milk bill and and um, it, it's kind of a, a low-hanging fruit but um, in the public health spectrum we do have concerns that people can get very sick for from consuming raw milk um, but it's a it's an acquired taste for those who have ever had it um, as a matter of fact they had it at the legislature a few years ago when that bill was out there and a number of legislators got really sick from consuming raw milk. Um, not oh, sure. At least they put their money where their mouth is. They so. did. Yeah. And uh, as again, as I said, it's a, an acquired taste. Um, one that I've had as a child and don't have a caringness to try again. Um, it is fresh out of a, a cow. Um, if that long as everything's clean and, and, and preserved, there you, you go for it. I, I, I can't imagine it would taste good on cereal um, or in your coffee. But um, if it, it's just a hard taste, but um, that's one of our, our lower hanging fruits. Um, we, we, we saw that the uh, harm reduction. Some say it tastes like freedom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll go with that. It, hey, well, your, but think about this, Bill. If you drank um, some of that raw milk, maybe the sand fleas would have moved to the next person that drank the sweeter well, they, milk. They gave us five minutes to consume your meal, so you had to pick what you wanted. <laughs> so raw milk probably wouldn't have been the one we picked. I but. think you got five minutes to eat and seven minutes in the bathroom, right? Yeah, to do your what three S's, which we won't mention on the air. Yeah. So, um, Is that true, five and seven? That was the... Pretty much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, that's that's it. That's maximum. So uh, we, we, <laughs> we'll go back to what we were talking about. Um, the, uh, the bills that did not um, pass and were glad was the harm reduction bill. It stayed in committee, did not get out. That would have done um, that, what, Bill? That pretty much would have uh, uh, disassembled all of our harm reduction clinics across the state. That this is have. the needle exchange programs yes, and the, such? the syringe access portion. That, that's what it was going to basically do, make the syringe access programs illegal and um, to be able to have. And if you did have them, you would be fined per day that you did that service. And um, it did not pass, but if it would have, that is basically the uh, meat that gets people through our door to our harm reduction clinics. And if we would not have had that, we would not have harm reduction clinics because basically the other services, um, such as um, treatment and vaccinations, we offer through other clinics um, that they would have had access to. So the harm reduction clinics would not have happened. And, and we, we see a lot of good that come out of those clinics. And we've seen a lot of people that are getting, getting clean 
and getting into programs, getting their lives reestablished. And that's why we do what we do. Um, and of course, I know it's already been talked about this morning uh, uh, with Mr. Hornby, the uh, immunization bill, which is um, a House Bill um, uh, 5105. Um, yeah, I spent my pretty much my the majority of my adult life in in public health and in protecting public health, and we were always fearful of um, bills that are going to come across that's going to do damage to the many, and this was one of those bills. Um, I'm all about um, rights, and, and we should be able to make our own decisions what we want. I, I agree with that. Um, I'm glad we live in a country that we have that ability, but immunizations is not necessarily about rights it's about protection it's about protecting our children and this bill 5105 basically says if you don't want immunizations for your children you don't have to have them and your children can go to school with all the other children that are immunized it's going to give you those relig religious and philosophical exemptions we've already had exemptions in place for medical reasons. So if your child is allergic to one of the vaccines, and they see their physician and they write an order saying, my child's allergic to this, they don't need to get it. That's fine, that's a medical exemption. But these are pretty much putting it out there that uh, that if you don't want your child to be immunized, you don't have to have them that way. They can go into a public school, they can participate in sports, um, but they have they can do that. And that puts a lot of people at risk. So basically, when this went to the, the House floor, 57 delegates voted in favor of that bill. 41 did not. So that was, so my way of looking at it, and, I, and I'm a little bit different to how I'm going to present it than what Dr. McLaughlin did the other day. And he's more or less, um, he's going to be a little bit more politically correct. But my way of looking at it. You're the, retiring, so you don't care. Well, the, I care, but um, I'm also going to put it right out there. The way I see it as a parent, as a public health um, director, I just saw 57 people that basically said, we don't care about those that are immunized all we're caring about is those that are not immunized or that want to be basically have their own decisions. And we're going to expose them to the children that are immunized. Just be, and I understand our legislators listen to their constituents. They're elected by their constituents. But I think I heard something in one of the intros about a social thing. And the, that is exactly it. it, it it's basically the few that have brought these issues. And, I, and some legislators bring their own issues to the floor to get bills for. I understand that. But this is basically our legislators looking at these immunizations that people said, I don't want my child to be immunized. I want to be able to make my own choice. Well, that's fine if your child's not going to ex be exposed to other children or my child that's immunized is going to be exposed to um to a child that's not been. We have done really good as the state of West Virginia um, over the years of being, this is one of the things we're known number one for doing good, and that is immunizing our population. We as a country have eradicated so many diseases, um, such as talked about polio and uh, measles, mumps, rebel. These are these are coming back. If you're not reading in the media about measles outbreaks, they're coming back. Twelve states have reported measles, yes, and one of them being right over in Washington County, right across the border, right across the river. We're seeing these coming back, and what we're doing is trying to push them away again and, and but our legislators passing bills such as this is doing nothing but making it a, a free way to be able to get those diseases back into our communities we have a lot of people we know berkeley county is the fastest growing county in the state we've been that way for as long as i can remember thousands of people are moving into berkeley county each and every year and those are people that are going to be coming in possibly from some third world countries. Um, we know polio is still existing in Afghanistan and Pakistan. If we have people coming in from those areas that polio is still there, they may not have been vaccinated for it, and they're going to bring that into the United States. That's why public health is there. We're not out for the popularity vote. We're not going to get it. What we're there for is to protect and that's our charge. Bill, in, in, towards the end of the interview with Mike Hornby in the last segment, he said, and I, I'm going to, I think I get the quote right. He said, COVID happened and Fauci happened. Mm -hmm. And the, the fallout from that, this was, 
the politicization of of COVID was what it was. Do you find, as a director of public health for a long time, did did the damage done, the perceived damage done at the federal level with with the health announcements that just seemed unreliable? Has that undercut, do you think, the voice of public health officials across the board? Is that is that why bills like this go through and it's because people just aren't listening to the public health officials? I think it did not help. Um, most certainly did not help. Um, we, we vaccinated thousands and thousands of people for COVID. And because we were trying to get this out of the pandemic mode, mm -hmm. we did that. It's now an endemic, but it's still alive and well. It's just a weakened strain. So if you get it, it's no, probably no worse than the mild case of the flu, um, as long as you're good and healthy and and um, and uh, you, you're going to get through it. Um, but it didn't help things. These vaccines that are uh, West Virginia deems as mandatory to attend public schools are not ones such as COVID. They're not ones such as getting your, your flu shot each year. These are great to have. Um, HPV, they're great to have. They're proven, they protect, but they're not required vaccines for children. We're talking about diphtheria, um, polio, um, what well, pertussis um, we're talking about measles mumps rubella um, we're talking about all these vaccines that that we received as as kids um, I, I remember getting the vaccine on sugar cube in in school um, and um, and and getting getting the uh, getting the test for different vaccines um, I remember getting smallpox in in, in school um, I got a couple times again um, in the military as well as that. and when we had a potential smallpox scare some 10 12 years ago um, we received those vaccines do we really do you want to ever ask a parent and say do you mind if your kid would get that crippling disease of polio well or I think you know there's also a crisis of memory here because people are today's new parents are at least two generations away from the last outbreak of polio. So we forget about what, I never knew anybody with polio in my childhood, but I knew folks from who were you know, 10, 12 years older than I, who had either had it or, or knew people who did. So when it's fresh and we know what it meant, I did have measles mm -hmm. and I don't remember, I was, I, was, I was a kid, but we're so removed from the diseases, there's sort of like rumors of diseases. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to have videos of this, this is, this is how bad it is, you know, the iron lungs and, you know, well, all that would that. have been a good rider to put on to that, uh, to the, the yeah. vaccine bill. Yeah. That if, if you don't, if you want to exempt, you've got to watch this video. I like well, the we do baby thinking. Olivia, right? Yeah. So you do, do this is, this is what smallpox looks like. It's, it, and it's more than just little scabs. It's, mm -hmm. it's a nasty disease. It is. And we've, we've, we've lost that, um, and representation it, it, that was in the previously in our, in our, uh, House of Delegates in, 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 in Charleston, uh, one of our local representatives that had polio and yeah. crippling disease. We have, you're right, we've lost that. We have a generation that doesn't really know, but history books are full of it. Google it. You're talking Google. about Larry Faircloth. Right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Who recently passed away. Passed away. Mm -hmm. um, great, great advocate for uh, immunizations. My uncle had it. He's. I think probably getting close to 70 now. Bill, if I am vaccinated, and, and I, I am, uh, and you're not, and you contract measles, whatever, am I at risk as a vaccinated person? Well, as we know, with every vaccine, it's not 100% effective. There is some small breakthroughs. So is there a potential? Yeah. If there's more people that are unvaccinated, does that increase its the virus's ability to become stronger and move from an unvaccinated to vaccinated person? Yes. If you have if you have that um, herd of non 
immune. <laughs> um, and you have more and more people coming into the area and more and more people are electing to not get vaccinated, pretty soon your population starts to grow of unvaccinated individuals. And the ones that are vaccinated are gonna become smaller and smaller. Now this is the worst case scenario, but you have to look at that. Are, you, are we looking at the majority of the group that are vaccinated or are we looking at the smaller, more vocal groups? Um, that want to have their own choice. That's I think those are the ones that our our delegates listen to. Now we we did hear some representation um, when in Charleston when we went down and talked to, from our del or from our uh, senators, and who feel that uh, if it did get out of the House side, it will not go anywhere in the Senate side. That's what we're praying for in public health. But um, even before we had COVID, we had seen the what we call the anti-vaxxers movement getting stronger and stronger to our legislature. And it takes a number, you know, five years plus to be able to get bills through, um, many of them anyway. And we have seen that movement over the over the history and it's getting a little stronger each year. So this is the kind of like year. a virus. It is. And and this is the first year it's gotten out of out of one of the the sides to the other. It's a crossover. Bill a part of the concerns about this, I, I know they keep stating religious freedom, but I, I don't really I, I think that's a very small percentage of of those who have concerns about vaccines. I think I've read that's less than 1%. Uh, and you're a minister. If you could, you, I don't know, you, you can quote for me in the Bible where it says you can't get vaccines. I'm not aware of that myself. But uh, in regards to the kids who are harmed by the vaccine, I, I know there are funds set up because of harm that's done uh, to kids who get the vaccine. And that, I think, is the bigger concern than the religious freedom among parents who don't want to get their kids vaccinated because they are afraid of injury. My oldest son was allergic to uh, the first round of the MMR vaccines, I guess. So he got red, swelled up, we had to take him back to the doctors right away. He was not permitted to get his second round of those. Mm -hmm. my, young, my younger son had no problems with those. But each year we had, you know, my son each year going into school, we had to provide the doctor's note that he's allergic to the vaccine. There are some who get worse reactions, though, and are harmed. Is there a screening process? Is there any research being done that can uh, some type of blood test that shows who would react harmfully to the vaccine and who would who would it be safe for? Um, certainly, CDC does uh, does research. They do testing continual. If there's someone that has a adverse reaction to a to a vaccine that they receive, it is mandatory that it gets reported to the CDC. But that's after the fact. It is after the fact. It's not before. Um, so many people think that their children are having adverse reactions to vaccines because they get a fever, they get a swollen arm, they get uh, um, they kind of lethargic for a, a day or two, that they think that that's a reaction to the vaccine. Well, it's it's just a reaction that they received the vaccine. It's not a reaction of the vaccine. Um, that's certainly any many types of vaccines you're going to receive is going to make your arm sore or red and and might get a little low grade fever. We can get that out of the flu shot. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some that have bad reactions to them um, that they, they may uh, go into anaphylactic shock. They may stop breathing. Those are ad those are adverse reactions to your vaccine that you would not want that repeated. And that's why we have medical exemptions allowable in the state of West Virginia. But you but you only but that's know. after the fact. Yeah, there's there's nothing before the fact that can tell a parent your your child does not have these markers that would indicate they would be allergic to the vaccine. Right. So my 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 grandson that was recently born will be, be two months old uh, uh, in a couple days. He received his first shot when he was one day old for hepatitis. Would we have known that he he has an allergy to it? No, but it was given in the hospital, and we wanted that. We wanted that level of protection from the very couple days of birth. So this is the challenge. <clears throat> I think a lot of people get their medical advice from WebMD and YouTube, right? So, and you yeah. can, that's always the chicken little. Or TikTok. Or TikTok. That's there you the go. new one. So somehow there has to be an effort to overcome the noise. And I think we have, in that process, we have to respect, we were all new parents at one time, and there is no panic greater than realizing that this naked little creature that came without an instruction manual is now my responsibility, and I have to not hurt it. I have, I have to make it thrive, and I have all of these noises saying that, that this is going to hurt, and this is going to hurt. Somehow, we have to elevate the, the professional and the sane points of view over all of the noise, which is why I asked about the, the, the whole 
politicization of, of COVID. I think that set public health back years because all of a sudden we're not thinking of these people are out for our benefit it came to these people are out to to put forward a political agenda whether it's true or not is irrelevant so i think the challenge for for people in your position and perhaps people in radio stations is to somehow make the voice of sanity louder than than youtube and tiktok Absolutely, and 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 so we go our, to our health healthcare providers when we're sick, right? We we'll mm-hmm. go to a clinic, we go to our doctor, we go to when we're sick. We need to learn to trust our healthcare providers a little bit more because they have a little bit more education in regards to vaccines and the, the adverse reactions. Still, trust your healthcare provider and give them the questions, and then use them as your guide to whether your child should get vaccinated or not. Um, because that's why they've invested a lot of time, a lot of money into their education to become a physician. You need to listen to your doctors and not TikTok. Right. Or or Twitter. Or Twitter. Or, excuse me, X. <laughs> yeah. uh, Matt Harvey, question? Point, comment, <clears throat> or just a cough? It, it was a cough. So um, why am I coughing, Bill? Because no. you're in this radio uh, station. You, it happens. You've not consumed so, enough so, oil milk. Um, Petri dish. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. All right. Look, I'm okay. I, I am happy with people to have raw milk. I'm just not a milk fan. Yeah. I just want to be clear, you everybody. I don't drink milk at all. Peter. I don't drink milk at all. So, yeah. But if you drink raw milk. How many times have you broken I'm bones? Happy. How many bones have you broken? Probably eight. You should drink milk. He doesn't do he doesn't do mayonnaise either. And, and he calls himself an American. I, I don't. <laughs> I am an American. You've got issues. Um, um, I do. I do. But it has nothing to do with that. So got about a minute and a half left. About these harm reduction, um, how, how close did that come? Because not not very close um we were worried about it because it had the potential and it, the damage was extravagant well i just read an article in in new jersey that they have with their opioid funds they spent about 100 million investing in harm reduction clinics throughout yeah. the state yeah i know for berkeley county i, I like to, I, i'm proud to say that we we're doing it right if anyone ever wants to see and and we we say this to our city of martinsburg who we're very happy that they provide funding for our clinics Um, you know when you look at our data that we have and the return rate on syringes the syringes that are being given out as part of the harm reduction clinic at the berkeley morgan county health departments are coming back we're not seeing those hit the streets it's not an enabling it's we're trying to protect them from reusing needles to keep episodes of hiv low um, hepatitis low we're doing it right in berkeley county Bill, on that note, we'll take our final break here. Always great to have you in the studio. Great to be here. Thanks for the work that you do. Thank you.